Hello and welcome to another episode of Conversations with Dr. Westman. Today's an exciting one. We're going to be chatting about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is proudly brought to you by Adapt Your Life Academy. We also have a bonus for you and it's Dr. Westman's free 10 things you need to know um, to how to lose weight uh, on a keto diet. We'll put a link for you in the description. How's it going, Eric? Doing well. How are you, Glenn? Very, very good. Thank you. So quite an interesting topic today. I'm sure you see this a lot in your clinic. And uh, the first question I have for you is, um, we obviously hear about fatty liver disease, and then we hear about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, disease. So what is actually the difference between these two? Right. Well, the, the underlying process that's going on, meaning and it's very descriptive, it means fat in the liver, fatty liver, used to only be seen in people who had chronic alcoholism. So um, it still exists, you know, where if someone is so addicted to alcohol, they don't even eat food and, and uh, they don't have the wherewithal to, to um, uh, get proper nutrition. So it's more complicated than just drinking alcohol, there, there are other things going on, but you would see fatty liver in those who were alcoholic, chronic alcoholism caused fatty liver up until recently, that was the only time you'd see it. So that's why the term non-alcoholic fatty liver disease came in to, to, to st distinguish it from the alcoholic fatty liver and then that because that's what was always seen before. And then I think the term was uh, there because you, you didn't wanna have a doctor or a health provider automatically assuming that there was alcoholism going on. You don't wanna stereotype someone to have that. But so that, if you think about chronic alcoholism and what happens, um, that fatty liver can turn to cirrhosis. And alcoholic cirrhosis fatty liver leading to cirrhosis used to only be seen in people who couldn't control drinking and then didn't eat as well. Alcoholism leading to cirrhosis means you, uh, you liver doesn't function. So you can develop jaundice, which is the yellowing of the eyes. You can develop a belly that looks like you're pregnant, but it, it's not a baby, it's fluid. So it's called ascites, which is fluid in the belly. And so that's the kind of, and then ble bleeding problems happen with chronic alcoholism. And, and, you know, I took care of many patients like this in training. And um, so that's not a path you want to go down uh, of fatty liver and cirrhosis and liver failure. Um, and non-alcoholic means that it's being seen now in people who don't have alcoholism. So what, what is actually causing, and can you break this down for us? So the term fatty liver disease means obviously there's fat surrounding the liver. And so how is this fat getting there and what's causing this? So even uh, technically it's fat inside the liver. So when you look, you do an ultrasound or a CAT scan, the liver itself looks entirely different. There's fat accumulation throughout the entire liver. Um, well, when I first got into this, I, I thought, is there another situation ever where they create fatty liver and it's called foie gras. Foie gras is a delicacy of, called that's fatty liver in French. That, that's the translation, foie gras. And the way you make fatty liver uh, is by force feeding geese carbs, sugar and starch. <laughs> so when I, I, this is years ago for me, I, the aha moment for me was it's not the fat in the food that causes fatty liver. Remember a, a, an alcoholic wasn't eating really anything other than drinking alcohol. It's not fat in the food. And so it turns out that it's the carbohydrates and geese that are fed today, corn, develop fatty liver. They're, they're overfed corn. And um, uh, so there's actually a, a lot of areas where fatty liver has been created on purpose like that for food delicacies. And I'm afraid that's still the same process as what happens in humans and people. So that is the sugar and the starches and the food 
that create the fatty liver. Now, how would somebody know that they have fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? You know, it's usually uh, noticed in a routine blood test where a liver blood test is elevated. These are lab tests called the AST or ALT. And so you might go to the doctor and they check an annual blood test or periodic blood test, and they'll tell you, well, your blood test, liver test is high, you probably have fatty liver. Now that's an assumption, but it's a likely assumption if you're overweight or obese or have diabetes, uh, that's the most common reason for it. A better way to actually then verify that you have it is some sort of imaging test like an ultrasound or a CAT scan where a uh, CAT scan has radiation. So an ultrasound is probably the most um, safest way to verify whether you have it or not. And occasionally that blood test elevation is not fatty liver. You know, that's an assumption that the doctor makes. Um, and so I would recommend that if, if, especially if you've had that blood test abnormality for a while, that you get the ultrasound to make sure there isn't something else going on to, to actually show that you have fatty liver or not. Um, and, uh, but usually it's a blood test that brings it to the doctor's attention. Otherwise it's asymptom um, you may not know because there are no symptoms. Asymptomatic was the term I was gonna say. So it's a silent sort of process until very late in the, the disease. Now, Eric, there is good news, isn't there? And the good news is that um, this condition can be reversed, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I've known for a long time that it's the carbs, the sugars and starches that cause it. And, and the reason for that is actually pretty simple. If, if you over consume sugar and starch, your body has to store it because, you know, if you, you either have to burn it or you store it and we don't store sugar, we store fat. So extra sugar is turned into fat in the fat cells and in the liver. And so the liver can do it really well and changes that sugar and starch to fat and then sends it out to the fat cells for storage. Uh, but um, the simple answer is to cut the carbs or do you know a keto diet or some sort of diet that cuts out simple sugars and refined flour. Our paper on this was published you know, over 10 years ago, where we showed by liver biopsies. So actually someone taking a, a needle and taking a sample of the liver, showing that the fatty liver could be fixed by a low carb keto diet. It's not that other kinds of programs can't do it too, but this one is particularly effective. But yeah, you don't want fatty liver. And I mean, uh, I work at an academic institution where we can actually do liver transplants here. We can do heart transplants at Duke. And I had to talk to someone who had already had a liver transplant, who was getting fatty liver again in the transplanted liver. And the transplant was because of fatty liver, non-alcoholic. And I had to instruct this person that actually it was the sugar and the starches causing the fatty liver in the first place. So now to save the transplanted liver, we have to do something for the lifestyle, you know, the, the carbs, cutting those down in order to save the transplanted liver. Isn't that, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> that, uh, so even doctors are not aware. So even gastroenterologists at academic institutions like mine don't understand that it's not the fat in the food that causes the fatty liver. It's the carbs, the sugars and starches. So you have to know a little bit about metabolism, a little bit about nutrition in order to make that connection. And then it's obvious, you know, of course. And then just mention that foie gras thing, if, if that makes sense to you, that it, it, they've known since Roman times, so the Romans used to give figs to geese to fatten the liver. That, and figs are basically carbs, sugar, so. Now, um, Eric, before I go on to the success rate that you have um, and also how long it takes to, to correct this condition, um, one question I have is, is it partial to men or women or is it, it, doesn't, it's, it doesn't distinguish between the two? It doesn't distinguish, yeah. It can affect both. Okay. So now the next question is, um, what sort of success rate do you have in your clinic with this condition? Yeah, well, it's basically... If you follow the program, it's 
<laughs> so, I mean, that's kind of the hedge I have. No, no program has 100% of people who can follow it, although we're doing everything we can to help people follow it. And if you're motivated to fix something like fatty liver that you don't want to get cirrhosis from, that's a good motivator to be able to follow a program like this. So the success is very high. And uh, because you're actually treating the root cause of the fatty liver by lowering the carbs in the food. So you can get an absolutely normal liver if you go on your program. Yes, and even what's remarkable is that the even early fibrosis, which is thought not to be reversible, can be reversed. We saw that in our liver study with liver biopsies. So fibrosis is thought to generally not to be reversible, but the liver is a remarkable organ that can actually remodel and change uh, itself so yeah, there's hope. Uh, and um, fatty liver is a, is a cinch. If fatty liver has gone, progressed more towards cirrhosis, and if it's irreversible, then no, I couldn't help fix the irreversible changes though. And the normal fatty liver, um, last question, how long will this take to reverse if somebody goes on your program? It's actually very quick. So the, the triglyceride in the blood is a reflection of the fat in the liver and the triglyceride can go down in a matter of a few weeks. So the, the fatty liver change um, in, in six to eight weeks can actually change remarkably. Um, and um, that, uh, in fact, my, my colleagues at Duke know this, uh, but you see, they wanna know the mechanism of why it occurs. So they're, it's kind of sad, they're more interested in figuring out why that happens rather than how to fix it, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, it, it makes sense when you think of it that way. They wanna have a, the big research program to fix, out the fix the mechanism when I can fix it by changing the lifestyle. Well, Eric, I know there's gonna be a lot of people that'll be very glad that they watched this particular episode and that there is hope for these people. Um, that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much. Um, don't forget your bonus, guys. Um, it's Dr. Westman's free 10 things you need to know to lose fat on keto. We'll put a link for you in the description. If you'd like to learn more about Adapt Your Life Academy and our new up and coming courses that will be available soon, you can find us on adaptyourlifeacademy.com. Eric, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time today. We look forward to catching up with you again next week. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you for your time. Take care. Bye-bye. If you like this video, you're going to love our Adapt Your Life Academy. So click on the link in the description to find out more.